Good afternoon, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, um, which is part of the 2020 ESB IIEA lecture series entitled Rethink Energy. And I'd like to begin by thanking the ESB for their sponsorship of this event. And at the Institute here, we very much value the collaboration uh, with the ESB in this, uh, in this series. We're delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon by a most accomplished uh, and interesting speaker, Sir Philip Lowe, who's partner in Oxera Consulting and chair of the World Energy Council's Trilemma Project. And I'd like to thank Philip in particular for being so generous with his time uh, to speak with us uh, today. Our guest will speak for about 20, 25 minutes. And after his presentation, we'll go to the Q&A session with you, um, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using that Q&A uh, function there on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And we're, we're all becoming so used to uh, all of this functionality now on Zoom. So please do go in there and uh, send us a question. And feel free to send your questions in throughout the session you know, as they occur to you, uh, rather than waiting until the end. So if you've got an insight, if you've got a brainwave question, just pop it in as soon as it occurs to you. And I would ask though, that you would identify yourself, your affiliation uh, as well, if you have one, uh, when you're asking a question. I'd like to remind you uh, that both the presentation and the Q&A session today are on the record. And if you're given to Twitter tweeting, um, please do, uh, tweet in the course of the session and the handle for us is at IIEA. So before we turn to Sir Philip Lowe, I'd like to welcome Pat Fenlon. Uh, Pat is the Executive Director um, of Group Finance and Commercial at the ESB. I'd like to ask uh, Pat to say a few words. Once Pat is done, um, he'll introduce um, our speaker and Pat will be remaining with us for the Q&A session and Pat may you know, be able to contribute or we may like to contribute, I'm sure we'd like him to do that, to any questions which have an explicit Irish dimension to today's discussion. So once again, um, I'm looking forward very much to our uh, guest speaker and also now to Pat Fenlon, who will introduce our guest. Thanks, Pat. Thank, thank you, Alex. And good afternoon, everybody. And, and just on behalf of ESB, just want to welcome you to, I suppose, what's now the fourth lecture in the Rethinking Energy series. Uh, it's a program that ESB has been proud to be involved with for over a decade now and uh, hope, looking forward to today's address by Sir Philip, which I think is really timely, uh, both in relation to COVID-19 and Brexit, particularly in the context of how that will impact on the energy transition, which is a subject very dear to our hearts in ESB. Our brighter future strategy is all about leading the transition to a low carbon energy future. And what that will involve for us is substantial investment in transformative uh, projects that will, um, with the aim of ensuring secure, affordable and sustainable electricity supply for our customers into the future. Brexit, I suppose, like, like many of you uh, here on the call, uh, is something we've been following closely in Ireland um, for in, in recent years. Um, and it's, it's certainly heating up, as we know at the moment. Um, ESB has been involved in the UK energy market for over 25 years, right across networks in Northern Ireland, uh, where we own the NIE business, uh, but also in onshore and offshore investments right across the UK, and also in EV charging infrastructure. And um, so it's a core market uh, for, for ESB. Regardless of what happens with Brexit, and I know we're all hoping for, for a sensible transition and, and an outcome uh, to that process, but regardless of what happens, we will continue to work closely with our counterparts in, in the UK energy industry uh, to hopefully continue on that, uh, that, that transition uh, towards the clean energy future. COVID-19, of course, has had a massive impact on all of us. Um, in ESB, um, we, we developed our first pandemic plan uh, response plan in 2006 uh, following the SARS outbreak and helpfully and it might be fortuitously but I suppose good planning at least a good luck we carried out a crisis management exercise for a pandemic six months before COVID struck and that did start, you know stand to us when when the outbreak happened earlier this year and the focus in ESB throughout COVID-19 has been ensuring first of all the safety of our employees our customers and the general public 
but also to maintain an essential electricity supply uh, throughout that period. In the first half of 2020, uh, ESB has delivered a solid, uh, you know, resilient set of financial results despite COVID-19 and the looming, uh, looming Brexit. Um, but maintaining financial strength for ESB is really important to allow us to deliver uh, the investment that's required in the future in both low carbon generation, but also in our electricity networks, which are crucial, not just for economic development and, and supply of electricity, but also for electrification of heat and transport, which is a critical uh, plank of the transition to a low carbon energy future. Um, we've seen on the international um, capital markets, debt capital markets, a, a massive appetite for sustainable investment. And pleased to say the ESB was the first Irish company uh, to launch a, a green bond, a public green bond in 2019. And you know, we see that appetite for such investment continuing. We do remain optimistic, um, you know, despite all the challenges, the climate action bill from the, the government, the Irish government, and also from Europe, the Green Deal, I think, you know, really uh, sets the, the, the course that we're all on uh, to, to respond uh, to climate change. So no, without any further ado, um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Philip's uh, address. I think it's timely and I think anything that helps us kind of understand the context and the challenge better for the energy transition will help us all get there. So without any further ado, look forward to your address and hand over to Philip. Thank you. So Alex and uh, Pat, thank you very much for those introductions. And it's a privilege to be speaking at the IAEA in your energy series. Um, I have to say, um, I feel a degree of humility surrounded by people from ESB uh, and AirGrid and uh, SODI and CRU and others who have contributed to the, uh, uh, the strategy in Ireland. Um, uh, you know as much, if not more than I do in many areas, but I hope that I can give some kind of strategic uh, view from, a, from a, a European perspective, uh, which will be useful to you in the future deliberations which we're having. Of course, um, in all the history of the European Union and, and Ireland, we've always talked about peripherality. And I have to say that the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on us all is that we seem to be all peripheral because, because we're all somewhat isolated into our own homes. Um, but I hope that through this type of webinar, we can uh, have uh, sufficient interaction to be able to debate the issues as we would have done if we were uh, together. So I'd, I'd like to proceed, um, first of all, by uh, looking at some of some slides which I've prepared. And um, uh, I've prepared them, I, I can assure you all with a certain degree of objectivity, because I don't represent the Commission anymore, even though I was Director General for Energy and for Competition, amongst other things, and I certainly don't represent the UK. Um, both institutions probably regard a uh, a British European, ex-British uh, European official is somewhat suspect. Uh, so I think you can guarantee a certain degree of uh, objectivity in the process. If we can move to the first slide, um, I think that uh, as far as energy is concerned in Europe uh, and in the UK, there's been a, in fact, a long-standing alignment of UK and EU energy policies to create open, integrated and competitive energy markets. And there's been a similar alignment on environmental and climate change objectives. But of course, as the result of uh, Brexit, the UK ceased to be a, uh, an EU member state on the 31st of January. And with the notable exception of the arrangements for Northern Ireland, uh, EU law will no longer apply to the UK after the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. Um, and in that process, uh, from the, uh, in terms of the content of the original withdrawal agreement, the UK specifically ruled out membership of the EU single market, the customs union, and by the way, the ETS. Uh, now the withdrawal agreement also makes it clear that 
the UK will no longer participate in any EU institution or agencies. So even though I'll come back on to that later, there are references in the, in the political declaration signed between the UK and the EU um, on energy, uh, they don't relate to um, some agencies such as uh, ASA at all. And as far as the transmission, the TSOs are concerned, uh, they talk about simple dialogue and cooperation. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we can look uh, a little, little bit more closely at the content of the declaration and what it has meant so far in terms of the negotiation. Uh, I think virtually everyone in, in the whole of Europe and the whole of the world knows that the UK is trying to negotiate a free trade agreement with the, with the EU. Seems to be a rather narrow version of um, trade uh, cooperation, but it's also quite a narrow version of what looks what what could be a future EU UK relationship because an FTA agreement as is envisaged only uh, is limited to um, removing tariffs and quotas on goods um, therefore excludes the services sector and excludes agreements on non-tariff barriers which is of course the major problem of uh, 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 regulatory uh, alignment now, there is also a, a commitment on either side to prevent distortions of trade and unfair competitive advantages, as well as maintaining high regulatory standards, but uh, not to regulatory al alignment, which has led to a degree of um, um, distrust and suspicion as to whether the UK intends to, um, uh, in, in, the, in the kind of vocabulary which has been used by UK politicians to, to break free from regulations at EU level and perhaps uh, adopt a more um, buccaneering approach to trade uh, and competition vis-a-vis -vis the EU. There's a commitment in the political declaration to cost efficient, clean and secure supplies of energy um, based on competitive markets and uh, access to networks and to facilitate technical cooperation in order to ensure security of supply and encourage sufficient trade through interconnectors. But um, there's clearly no reference to any maintenance or development of shared market rules and network codes. Um, and there's a commitment to continue cooperation as I have referred to earlier, between systems of TSOs, but no mention of cooperation between regulators. So if we go on to the next slide, um, we have some positive elements in the protocol, which are very important for Ireland and Northern Ireland, no hard border in principle, protection of the all island economy and of the energy market, respect of the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, um, maintenance of the single all-island electricity market, continued application of EU laws and regulations in Northern Ireland in, in respect of this, uh, of this, the um, internal market on the island of Ireland in terms of state aid rules and competition rules, and continued North Sea, North-South cooperation. Now there's a, a reference in it also to best endeavours to stimulate trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK single market. As you are aware, the UK government is now on a unilateral basis trying to strengthen this through its uh, proposed internal market bill, which is uh, in principle in con contravention with the terms of the protocol and the withdrawal agreement. Uh, but we wait to see what the outcome of that discussion will be. On the next slide, we, we turn to the, the immediate impacts of Brexit, Brexit on the energy sector, short-term uh, impacts and perhaps then long-term impacts. Now, unless there is no deal, um, we shouldn't exaggerate that the immediate impacts, impacts will be very substantial. Uh, UK and the EU energy policies remain largely aligned. 
um, similarly with climate change policies. Both, both sides have raised the ambitions for CO2 emissions reduction for 2030 and 2050. And the UK has transposed the bulk of existing EU energy directives into national law. And thirdly, which is obvious, the UK remains physically connected in gas and electricity to, to EU member states, notwithstanding the thousand megawatts to, to Ireland, to and from Ireland, there's also up to 4,000 megawatts of interconnection um, with other uh, EU countries. And given ongoing cooperation between uh, TSOs, um, one would expect that uh, trade will continue to take place and even new, in, even new interconnectors like Green Line are under construction. Of course, if there is no deal, some, there's obvious potential for delay and confusion. I see that possibly more in, uh, in, the, in terms of uh, gas trading than in electricity, but um, uh, widespread disruption is probably unlikely. Um, clearly, technical agreements will have to be made. And ultimately, if there is no deal now, the question would then be, will there be a deal sometime later? So will this be a question of some interim arrangements? And the important thing there, as, as you all know from uh, uh, with the experience of European negotiations, try and prevent the provisional from being permanent. <laughs> now, on the next slide, I've turned to the, the longer term impacts, and I've referred already to the fact that there's um, no commitment to regulatory align alignment. Um, it's unlikely that the market rules and network codes will continue to, to be aligned unless the UK is somehow associated to EU discussions on, on the design and the adoption, the adaptation of energy market rules. Now, um, one might say, is this uh, one-sided? I think the fact is that it's reluctance on both sides. Um, EU agencies and committees can invite uh, third country representatives to participate in their discussions. But there are plenty of voices within the EU who dislike the idea of the UK uh, choosing the parts of the single market with it, with which it wants to be involved in and not others. Um, and obviously, if there is divergence on, uh, on uh, market rules and network codes, this is going to lead to less efficient market functioning, less um, and, and less um, competition, less liquidity as well. On the next slide, um, I, I think that uh, obviously your focus will be on Ireland itself and its, uh, its own security of supply. From the end of this year, Ireland becomes an, an energy island in, in U EU terms, um, in principle, cut off from the the uh, the rest of networks in in the e EU, and it's logical in that respect that the Celtic interconnector uh, has become a European project of common interest, with a direct link between France and Ireland, and a commitment of 500 billion from the EU budget um, for that project, but. Of course, we don't expect that to become, come on stream until 2025. There is certainly more and more self-sufficiency through renewables, but um, for the moment, Ireland is, is very much linked with the UK market, both in electricity and gas. There's a UK commitment to North Sea cooperation, um, but as you've probably read, there's some degree of um, Dis dis discord as to whether the UK could uh, stay in that uh, cooperation framework. It wasn't, if I remember rightly, as Director General uh, for Energy, it wasn't um, uh, an EU body at all uh, in 2010. But since I left, certainly, uh, North Sea Corporate, North Sea Energy Corporation has become 
co-chaired with the Commission and it seems that there is a debate as to whether the UK could be involved or not. Well, that's connected to the wider about, debate about UK willingness to participate in EU-sponsored uh, initiatives. And of course, there is also a, a, a discussion as to whether local content should issue uh, rules, should issue, should uh, influence the decisions taken on construction of offshore um, equipment. So on the next slide, we turn to um, further measures. Well, here we go, go into the, the realm of uh, perhaps uh, more pragmatism in the, in the way in which uh, we could go forward, given the blockage uh, on, the, on institutional grounds one could expect that there will be some, some degree of, um, as Alex has referred to, brainwaves or insights as to how future cooperation could be uh, guaranteed, um, whether uh, the SEM, despite being now based on EU market rules and network codes, one could not form some kind of framework in which the UK could take part in that. And, uh, what would possibly be uh, some form of um, of coupling of the of the UK market with the EU and uh, with the Irish and the rest of the EU markets? Energy efficiency will remain a key component of all discussions on security of supply, and certainly in Ireland, where it has to think uh, very much about um, the potential need for, for backup generation capacity. Um, whether, as we have seen recently, the gas-fired power plants figure in even a transition uh, scenario is not clear, but it, it may be that they are not a thing of the past, uh, at least until 2030. So then we turn to um, uh, the next slide. And we add um, uh, COVID-19's uh, short-term impacts. Um, I think uh, all of you have uh, uh, seen the reports of the IEA on the impact on the energy sector. An average 25% uh, decline in demand, a 50% decline in oil demand, a 50% drop in road transport year on year and uh, inevitably um, because of the uncertainty associated with COVID uh, and a fall in investment in energy. Um, nevertheless, overall energy systems have been resilient during the crisis as, and Pat has referred to the situation in Ireland itself. Globally, low carbon sources of energy are overtaking coal as the primary source of energy, power, energy for power generation. They have priority access to grids and low operating costs. Investors are tending to steer away from fossil fuels at the moment, taking a longer term view than governments. Gas demand also, is also likely to fall in, by 5% in this year after 10 years of growth. And we've seen in the last, um, uh, in, in the last expected, we expect in 2020, a uh, fall uh, in CO2 emissions. Um, as, I, as I wrote here, a decline which is six times larger than the, the fall resulting from the economic uh, decline after the financial crisis. So if we go then to the following slide, and take um, uh, a longer term, longer view. I've referred to the fact that invest investors are favoring renewables, but of course, prices of oil and gas are historically low. And using existing fossil fuel power plants is still a viable option in the short term if regulations permit it. And oil and gas are also needed in all modes of transport, at least until 2030. Maybe we can see uh, displacement of oil by gas in, in maritime transport 
uh, in particular, and also in commercial transport. Looking at the long term, there's a lot of aspiration around. Uh, the European Council has highlighted the crucial role of energy in uh, Europe's economic recovery and underlined that the economy needs to become greener, more circular, more digital, building on the European Green Deal. That's uh, thankfully a commitment which uh, hopefully um, all the member states of the European Union will sign up to. And it's something which uh, uh, the UK amongst other uh, third countries uh, share as an objective. If we move to the next slide. The crisis obviously has had an effect on consumer behavior and on the location of, of um, economic activity. Uh, we're all experiencing um, living through the trend towards teleworking, to online purchasing, as well as delivery to and services in the home. And it's fair to say that it's unlikely that uh, people and particular bus particularly businesses are going to return to previous working, shopping and servicing habits. And that may have um, implications for energy demand patterns and for distribution networks, which I'm not qualified to talk about, uh, but I'm sure that it is being studied by ESB and others. The economy is becoming increasingly digital with a consequent increase in demand for electricity for service, for example. It's becoming increasingly digital, digital with some degree of um, impact on the market power of major players, major high-tech companies. And this is a challenge for competition policy globally, to what extent um, with this increasing digitalization, we have really any control over the, uh, in, from a public point of view, on the, on the uh, uh, behavior of these companies. For the time being, public transport all modes, as well as car sharing, don't offer people adequate protection from the virus. And one can see the renewed importance of the private car. And if, uh, if anyone can afford it, electric vehicles. Lockdown measures hit poorer people harder than others. Energy poverty has become an issue again in all our countries. We move then to the following slide. Um, I'd just like to refer to what um, colleagues in the IAEA have referred to as a ripple effect and, and draw some preliminary conclusions from uh, the interaction of these various um, uh, um, impacts and, uh, and, uh, and almost crises on our own lives. Before Brexit, we, we were already facing the challenges of recovery from the financial crisis and uh, um, engaging in the energy transition towards a greener economy. Now, while Brexit is happening, we have a pandemic which is persisting with, with no final solution yet in sight. Um, um, one talks of vaccines, even uh, and as we move forward, uh, we don't see an immediate um, horizon for the, for the use of those vaccines. And as for Brexit, Brexit itself, this is, after all, a political and economic crisis of some dimension, uh, at least for the UK and also for its immediate neighbours, the ones who are most affected in the European Union, that is Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands, France. The UK has impose this because of a democratic vote and successive governments have uh, since the referendum chosen to interpret what that vote meant in terms of a, perhaps a harder rather than a softer exit from the U European Union with, with full withdrawal as I referred to earlier from EU institutions, agencies and in principle even any programme. The EU, EU's response has also been to emphasize that particip participation in the single market has to be total, not partial, with the acceptance of all the responsibilities as well as the advantages. And that can 
uh, lead to some degree of deadlock in some of the talks which uh, have taken place between the UK and the EU. So in the next slide, uh, I just go on to, to, to look at uh, what, what could be the basis for further progress or, or resumption of progress. Um, I think uh, the energy uh, market is uh, one example among others where the UK and its European neighbours have the potential to retain and expand the cooperation and links which they've already established between each other within the EU. But this requires a lot of more mutual trust and confidence and a degree of pragmatism to develop new frameworks which both sides can live with even if they both feel uncomfortable in them. And then in the next slide, I just uh, recall, apart from the uh, benefits which are obvious uh, through a cooperation uh, in energy and uh, market interconnection and, and integration, um, finding a new framework requires everyone to um, work together um, absent institutional preconditions on both sides and that's a major challenge at the moment. That being said, if you look back at the history in Ireland in particular, the spirit behind the Good Friday Agreement should in principle inspire everyone to work towards energy solutions which are good for Ireland, for Northern Ireland, for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. Um, I was reminded um, when uh, addressing this theme um, before that um, Patrick Kavanagh had something interesting to say about the, the issues which face us or the challenges which face us in life. In his, in his poem, Epic, uh, I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided uh, who owned half a root of, uh, of rock. Um, that was the year of the Munich bother, which was more important. And to get, today we have uh, a combination of um, uh, the challenge of climate change, we have the challenge of a pandemic, we have increasing uh, so far lack of um, support for multilateral action and cooperation, and we have Brexit. Um, and uh, which of these issues is the most important for the future? I think that uh, Ireland has always shown the example. It is necessary to build alliances and find common solutions. That's the basis upon which Europeans, uh, the European Union has worked to find solutions which can't be achieved by one country on their own. Now, that can always be challenged in individual areas, but uh, pragmatically, uh, both the UK, Ireland and the European Union must look for areas where progress can be made and energy is one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, for its eloquence and for the assistance of Patrick Kavanagh in uh, bringing home, I suppose, the uh, some of the, uh, the the points that um, that you wanted to make, and I think we often do turn to the poets, and I think the period we're living in at the moment, we're turning to our poets perhaps even more often than than we have in the past, and that's probably a pretty good thing. Um, so thank you very much for those insights. We've got a number of. Uh, very interesting uh, questions um, lining up on the Q&A function. And just to remind everybody again that you can use the Q&A function just down in the bottom, well, on my screen, sort of bottom right-hand corner-ish of, of your screen and go in there and just send a message, just like sending a WhatsApp message or a text message, and that will come through to us. And some of you have been doing that already. So I'm going to start off with a couple of quick uh, questions uh, some of which you might like to try and that, um, but maybe some 
perhaps might be, uh, and from Councillor Sarah Riley, whether you believe the North-South Interconnector project will continue. Um, now you, you, might, you, might want to, you might want to change that yourself into whether you think it should continue as opposed to whether you think it will continue, but do you have any thoughts about the Interconnector? Well, I mean, <clears throat> it's one component of a, an increasingly, well, it should be an increasingly integrated network uh, which will which offers some degree of uh, advantage both in terms of security of supply resilience of of, system, of systems and um, uh, is is a is a an important component of the links which should be maintained and promoted with with the UK from Scotland to to Northern Ireland from and uh, those from the south of Ireland to the UK and ultimately to France as far as electricity is concerned. So I, I think the, the this is do do I believe that the North South Interconnector project will proceed is my answer first of all is that I think it should proceed and that for the reasons I've just uh, emphasized before um, we have to look at uh, we have to tolerate uh, and uh, work on um, uh, the issues which separate the UK and and uh, some some of the interests in NI from the uh, the aims of the project and find out and create uh, frameworks where it can go ahead. I believe that it should go ahead personally. I think that studies have shown that it would be of tremendous benefit. Um, it's not the only answer to energy problems in on the island of Ireland, but it's one important component. If I'm not mistaken, I think Sarah might well be channeling some and re reflecting on some of the um, some of the controversies, let me put it that way, on yeah. the infrastructure that, that we've had locally. So, I mean, that maybe that's obviously the subject of ongoing debate, but the, the big picture point you've you've addressed and in fact the next question is also about um, interconnectors more broadly it's from Fergal McNamara um, who's the chair of the World Energy Council Ireland um, I think you may know Fergal I've come across Fergal yeah, yeah. Um, and he's known to the uh, here um, and Fergal says in light of announcements yeah in, in light of the announcements of new interconnectors uh, GB to Norway uh, and uh, to, uh, another one to the Netherlands and GB to Denmark and Iceland, how can this be reconciled with the portents of increasing divergence of market rules? Well, just to, to, to uh, final word to Sarah on the internet interconnector. I mean, uh, one of the things we tackle very much in the European Commission, and uh, and we were tackling uh, outsiders as well, is making sure that local communities are fully aware of the benefits of any infrastructure improvement and finding a ways in which they can be associated with and um, the, the, um, the projects concerned. So it is always going to be a major challenge, um, uh, but it's something which requires a lot of public debate and an open discussion, looking at the overall advantages, but also taking into account the impacts on local communities. Now, as far as the interconnect interconnectors are concerned, um, I think that after a period of some, some hesitation uh, um, in the early 2000s, um, the UK, successive UK governments, coalition government uh, under David Cameron and, and um, Liberal Democrats, but also later have um, committed themselves to supporting interconnection as an important important contribution to security of supply and to more liquidity and more competitiveness on the UK market. And um, of course, um, if then you are confronted with uh, uh, the institutional challenge and the political challenge of Brexit, you have to say, well, um, how can you, on the one hand, um, 
want to develop such systems which uh, are interconnected and integrated without common rules. Now, I, I have argued this myself with many of my compatriots who are uh, whose names are well known in UK politics, and they say, "Well, we don't want European rules; we want international rules." And I say, "Well, where, which would you prefer? Would you want US rules or Chinese rules, or, um, or would you like those rules to be perhaps uh, more um, uh, adapted to?" to uh, conditions in Europe? And the answer is, well, they, it, there is an institutional blockage on this, that, that the, the idea of uh, European Union being some kind of political organization, which is, which is um, taking away the identity and powers of, of uh, autonomous um, uh, countries in Europe, is something which is very strong in the political um, flavor of the moment in, in London and elsewhere. But I personally believe that um, the, the practical advantage of these interconnections, the fact that they are not just simply with EU, EU countries, but they're with um, Norway, which is obviously part of the single market. And there's also um, uh, plans for um, interconnection with Ireland. And in the end, the practicalities of working out how to manage transmission capacities and manage trade inside uh, on electricity um, uh, are, are, will, will dominate ultimately um, on the, uh, over the, issue, the institutional issues. Now, uh, how long will that take? I don't know. Uh, I just simply believe that uh, uh, in order to recreate the trust and confidence uh, on the UK side, at least, we have to provide a framework for talking about market rules and, um, and network codes, etc., which doesn't necessarily have labels which um, uh, make them withdraw completely from any discussion. Thank you. Um, another question here from Don Lobrolacon, um, who's a member of the IIA here. Any lessons for us from existing EU links with another energy island, quote unquote, for example, Switzerland uh, or Norway, uh, also noting Norway's powerful position as an energy supplier? So any lessons from Switzerland, Norway, I, I, I EU think, links? Uh, Alex, the, the, the Donald is, is correct to, to look at these, um, these uh, comparisons. Um, uh, I'm not sure that one could describe Switzerland or Norway really as an energy island, um, because physically they're, they're very much inter interconnected with the, with the European market. Um, uh, whether they're, and of course, Norway as part of the single market uh, is, is, is very much in it, whereas Switzerland isn't. What can we learn from Switzerland? Well, the first thing to say is that Switzerland has the main, has the same sort of institutional issues with the EU as the UK, although perhaps a smaller scale and a different location, geographical location, which is right in the middle of Europe. And um, what has Switzerland been trying to do since uh, it has rejected uh, EU membership and rejected um, e, uh, single market membership? It has it's tried to negotiate sectoral agreements with the European Union in a large number of areas. I think there are all, already uh, over 100 agreements between the EU and Switzerland. And um, frankly, the EU has been increasingly... I say EU, the other member state, the, the, the EU member states have been increasingly impatient about this. That Switzerland seems to want to do a certain number of things with the European Union, but is not really prepared to accept the common rules of, for example, competition policy and of state aid. And um, so there is a now increasing reluctance from the EU to go, go into 
more agreements with um, the um, the uh, EU uh, with Switzerland, even though it would make eminent sense for it, on, on practical grounds for it to do so. Now it may be that um, if you if you look at it in the future, in, in ten or fifteen years time, it may be that uh, the combination of UK and Swiss Swiss pressure to um, to reach agreements on interconnection and on trading across um, the European markets uh, will result in some degree of uh, a great, greater degree of pragmatism on, uh, on the EU side, but it would also probably imply that on the Swiss and UK side, they have to accept some, some institutions, some agencies, uh, regulation on regulation or on tra transmission system operation, which are supranational, which is, of course, the thing which they are not, um, uh, the UK side is, is not uh, keen on for the moment. Now, as far as Norway is concerned, I think there is a direct um, uh, lesson to be learned in terms of how uh, Ireland and the UK and other EU countries could cooperate together in uh, achieving some degree of market integration without uh, without uh, it being necessarily in a an EU framework. And that's um, the the development of the Nordic um, electricity market, which uh, is now more and more integrated into the EU system. But at the beginning was uh, was uh, began with cooperation and, um, and trading between between the Scandinavian countries, and I think there there's a, 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 an opportunity for for people in the UK, Ireland, and elsewhere to to talk to those uh, talk to those in Finland, in Norway, and Sweden, and, and discuss how how that cooperation began and how it could be. A useful model for future cooperation uh, until we get some large, wider solution. Actually, I, I could have uh, combined the following question with uh, Donald O'Brolicon's question because it comes from uh, John O'Hagan, professor of economics in Trinity, uh, Trinity College, and he was asking, is there any other non-EU state with a similar interdependence in terms of energy supply uh, with the UK, with the EU, as has the UK, and he was just wondering, well, could the could similar arrangements be applied? Now you reflect on some of those points already. I don't I, know. If I, I think I've reflected. Additional on occurs to you, Eliza, from that. Question. I think. Yeah. I think the because one's self criticism of of the of the EU and the EU member states, which, which uh, uh, it ought sometimes to be asking itself, or member states of the EU. Uh, as a whole is um, to have an agreement with um, another country outside the EU doesn't necessarily mean that they have to conform to EU rules. You know, there is a general assumption of, I, would, I wouldn't say regulatory imperialism, but it's something like that, which, is, which comes, um, which derives from this, the the depth uh, and strength of the discussion between uh, EU governments and between um, national administrations, if we've reached, if we have reached, or I say we, but if EU countries have reached an agreement between themselves, between 27 member states, they're not particularly keen on adapting the rules for a, for a, a third country because they've already reached a very very difficult compromise between them and so um, there are countries uh, uh, outside the European Union who, who would very much like to uh, have uh, energy relations with the European Union um, but they are basically at the moment in the category of um, countries which are regarded as um, potential accession countries or association countries. I'm talking of the, the southeastern Europe in Bosnia and Serbia, as, as well as, of course, the Ukraine. 
And um, if you look at uh, what the EU has done, irrespective of those countries in, 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 in the energy area, it's, um, it's created, uh, sponsored uh, the energy community, which comprises the EU member states and um, accession countries, basically. Um, and it, is, it encourages them to adopt EU energy market rules. And the same is true of uh, the association agreement with um, Ukraine. So that's another set category of countries beyond Norway and Switzerland and Iceland, by the way, which, um, which could be, which um, um, is, is an example as a model but it's a model which is unlikely to be very attractive to the UK's and the Switzerland's. Okay, I've got two questions about gas. Um, first of all, David Kelly of Arvia, which includes Gas Networks Ireland. Um, and David says that you've referred to gas being necessary for the interim. How long is this interim in your view? And what technology will replace gas? And the second question, is from John Drynan of Electric Ireland. Should Ireland reconsider the planned LNG terminal in the Shannon estuary for security of supply reasons? So two questions. Um, how long is the interim and what will replace it? And then the LNG uh, proposal. I don't know, you presume, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the, 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 the Shannon LNG. Yeah, yeah. Uh, terminal proposal, but you can yeah, I find more difficulty with the second question because it's it, in, the, in the end it's a commercial question, <laughs> um, hmm. and, and uh, one would have to make a clear assessment of the short and uh, well, the, the risks and advantages. I, by the way, the more integration. If I can answer that question first, the more integrated gas networks are in Europe, um, and the more, therefore, the more competitive is the price of gas in Europe, and not simply um, uh, price of pipeline gas in Europe, not simply determined by take or pay contracts with uh, the, the, the two or three major uh, suppliers around Europe, um, the less attractive is LNG because if there is good, if there is, if there are flexible long term contracts and a good secondary market in gas, then generally speaking, that pipeline gas into the uh, European networks should be um, uh, competitive vis a vis LNG. But of course, LNG, uh, LNG is an alternative which is an investment to be made, particularly when you think of uh, possible disruptions of supplies. And um, there have been, and although the LNG terminals have historically had very low utilization rates. Um, they have nevertheless, from time to time, uh, served their purpose in uh, dissuading um, those uh, major producers who felt that they can possibly increase prices and exploit markets simply because there's no alternative. Um, and frankly, the LNG market at the moment is, is seems to be fairly liquid. Um, it, it the gap between the price of natural of pipeline gas and LNG is, is certainly a lot narrower than 10 years ago. Um, uh, to be cautious about gas, pr providing the answer to the first question, which is how, how long will we need natural gas? Um, one, one should go ahead with the project <laughs> uh, to be cautious. Now then, but then look at the, the potential for gas in the future. What, what are the, what are the, what is the major debate in Europe about gas? Um, um, is it viable to still invest in gas uh, now? This, we are in 2020, 
we have very significant uh, CO2 emissions objectives for 2030 and 2050. Um, does it make sense to put uh, any more money into gas-fired power stations? Um, well, you could start the kind of discussion which is being being debated in the Netherlands and uh, Germany. Why don't we try to uh, diversify the types of um, the sources of energy which are being used in gas infrastructure, particularly the use of hydrogen, either blue or, or, or green. Um, uh, trying to, in fact, to um, move away from fossil fuel of, of the CO2 rich gas to less CO2 um, emitting gases, um, but recognizing that in the, in, at least in the next 10 years, it, it, gas will, will be needed, whether for heating or for industrial purposes. And then there's the issue as to whether um, gas hasn't, there aren't new uses for gas, such, a, such as I've referred to in, in maritime transport and commercial transport. And um, here again, there may be a link between um, um, the second question about LNG and the first question. If, if there are new, if there are new sort of new markets for gas, um, uh, it, particularly maritime, is, is it um, is it isn't it better to import LNG for the for those purposes and use it there? Frankly, Alex, I'm not re replied very clearly to either of those questions because they're very, I think they're quite difficult. I think that, that uh, what we previously thought was a, a fairly clear situation for gas, uh, for uh, gas over the next uh, 10 to 15 years has become um, a less certain picture uh, because of the revised uh, CO2 targets. Um, uh, that being said, there must be some, got some new thinking about how to use the extensive gas infrastructure in Europe, which is there and which uh, is an advantage. And um, therefore, the biogas, hydrogen are among the alternatives we should look for. And on the issue of Shannon, I have to say, I, I couldn't express a clear view, but I, I would to be cautious, uh, uh, would um, be hedging bets and not abandoning something which could be that's useful understood. later on. Yeah. No, that's understood. We, um, we've got a couple of other questions on, 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 on gas, gas and hydrogen, but we're coming up on two o'clock. And I do have just one other uh, question here, which I'll also ask Pat to come in on, if I think Pat is still with us. Um, it's from Ken Spratt, senior civil servant um, here in Dublin, and I worked very closely with, with Ken when I was Minister for Energy myself. So um, Ken is a real, a real leader uh, and, and huge knowledge of, of, of this field as well. But he also um, very nicely uh, brings back in the uh, poetic uh, allusion from, from, from earlier, from Kavanagh. And uh, Ken points out that Kavanagh finished uh, that poem, Epic, by mentioning Homer's ghost. Uh, quote, I made the Iliad from such a local row, unquote, yeah. is a line we all remember. And uh, the question is, and as I said, Pat, by all means, perhaps Pat might come in on this first. And we are coming up on two, so we're a bit tight for time. The question is, is there an Iliad in this for Ireland, perhaps harnessing from offshore wind, Ken wonders? Do you like to handle that, Pat? Sure. Well, I, I'd, um, I think offshore wind, um, there is a massive opportunity in offshore. We, we, all know, we all know what the wind is like on the island and what, is, you know, what it's like off the island. Um, we are coming from behind um, in terms of harnessing offshore wind and I'm pleased to see the government are taking steps to accelerate uh, you know, the, the, the MAFA bill and, and the Minister Ryan is on record as being very strongly promoting uh, to take up the offshore wind industry and, and of course ESB would be a participant in that hopefully um, but it is a massive opportunity 
Um, I think it does come back to earlier questions as well about interconnection because um, what we need more renewables, um, you know, better system services and better interconnection for, for all of this to hang together. Uh, but there is definitely uh, an opportunity in this transition for Ireland, uh, given the, the, the huge quantum of, of wind resources that we have. So absolutely, look, conscious of time, maybe better if, let Philip come in on that one as well. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it, um, Ireland is already during the night a net exporter of electricity to the UK because of offshore wind, because of onshore and offshore, onshore wind. Which, um, uh, both, but particularly onshore, uh, and that's that's a, that's a potential which should be exploited uh, clearly. Although, I mean, the reality is that once you you're in an integrated competitive market, um, uh, is, it, is it correct always to refer to to um, to um, export opportunities and import opportunities as if national borders actually define the markets, which sometimes they don't. I think what's being defined is really where the look, what, what where, where are generating plants or where is um, sources of energy located and what opportunities are there to, to sell their, pro, their product in the rest of the EU or elsewhere. And I think prospects are good. I referred incidentally to that, that, that debate about local content, you know, to what extent new installations have to be um, uh, supplied, uh, manufactured locally. Uh, Ireland still remains in a very strong position vis-a-vis -vis the UK because of meteorological conditions and sea conditions to to be able to exploit um, the market there as well as as well as frankly with France but um, I, 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 I'm not sure that um, I, I just want to answer one question which I see on the screen which is you know can can gas power generating stations be run from gas ship by sea yes they can there's no reason why they you, you can't use LNG for 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 electricity generation, Lithuania has done it uh, um, with its own uh, LNG plant. Um, uh, LNG, therefore, is a source of of um, as it re represents alternative supply, both to uh, in, in for all forms of energy. But of course, you've got to look at the economics of ch transforming LNG into electricity, which may or may not be as competitive as in the present circumstances, for example, as to, to using renewables. Thank you. Just before we wrap up, just to um, remind you, remind people that the next event um, that the Institute will host um, covering the issue of offshore wind um, so that's timely for people and interesting for people. It's with Alla Weinstein of Trident Winds, and that uh, event is on Friday, the 20th of November. It's not the next event of the IEA, but it's the next relevant event to offshore wind on Friday, the 20th, 20th of November at 2 p.m. So it only remains for me to thank, uh, warmly thank Sir Philip Lowe for his presentation uh, this afternoon, for his answering and addressing of questions, including those that I put to him and those that he had the uh, flexibility and dexterity to see himself on the screen. So I want to thank him for uh, you know, giving us the benefit of his in immensely wide knowledge and experience and insight. Uh, uh, it's been not only very informative, but given us, I think, a lot to think about and reflect on. I want to thank, thank again Pat Fennan and the ESB uh, and uh, note again the importance of the collaboration that the, we have, uh, that the IEA has with the ESB uh, on this series. So it's been an extremely informative and interesting uh, um, experience uh, this afternoon. A number of phrases always stick with me after these um, occasions. And one is where in the course of your presentation towards the end, you were talking about the importance or the desirability of countries working together 
absent institutional preconditional preconditions, which covers really quite a multitude when you're when, when one observes what's happening at the moment in terms of what the you know what the possibility and what the options mm -hmm. what the chances for cooperation will be post brexit um, as elsewhere so thank you once again sir philip lowe uh, for your uh, presence this afternoon and thank you all for your attendance and there we will finish for today <laughs>